Fairies have existed for thousands of years in pagan traditions before Christianity. But what is the history of their transformation in art and culture? From the devious beings that they once were, to the innocent Disney fairies that we now know and love. Fairies have a history in all traditions of Northern Europe, including Celtic, Slavic, Nordic, Germanic, and French. But after Christianity, belief in fairies was denied, and they were usually classified as demons. The word fairy has a complex etymology, taking its root in the Latin word fata, or fates, which is why these mischievous creatures are said to tamper with the lives and destinies of the humans that they encounter. They are related to the beauty of spring and its flora, but also as spiteful sprites who speak to the irrationality of existence. Although they were still maintained in folklore, visual representations of fairies began to change during the Renaissance. In Britain, where fairy painting would eventually become immensely popular during Romanticism, William Shakespeare's comedic play A Midsummer Night's Dream, written around 1595, particularly popularized fairies, with its story of humans and fairies mingling. The play's characters famously included Fairy King Oberon and Queen Titania, along with Puck and a legion of other fairies, whose individual origins are rooted in Northern European folklore. The popular play had a long-lasting influence on artists, and by the mid to late 18th century, romantic artists had begun to turn to fairies as a motif for dreams or otherworldly experiences. So it seems like predictably fairies come back again during paganizing periods, and they also speak to mischief because of that less centralized harshness of a totalizing god, instead more of a naturalistic, whimsical attitude. In the classic art history text Form in Gothic, Wilhelm Warringer wrote about the northern world of spirits and the peculiarity of Germanic religious feeling. He describes a vague impersonal agitation, a tremendous force, as it were, of abstract energies which take shape only occasionally and then in a deceptive, enigmatic, irritating manner. And also a belief in wild spectral doings, the irrational, the unaccountable, is the essence of the belief in spirits and ghosts. Herein lies the peculiar horror of this domain of belief or delusion, and herein also lies the unstable vacillation of its forms. He contrasts Germanic mythological figures with classical Greek ones. Quote, Between the beautiful, clear-cut, plastic character of the classical Olympus and the quite unplastic, impersonal transcendentalism of the Orient, there comes this hybrid world of northern gods and spirits. Just when this world of gods appears to be within one's grasp, it eludes one to melt into formless phantoms. The figures of the gods have something intangible about them. Every time they were personified, the nature of their powers appeared to elude the application of any human standard. The gods were considered as impersonal, in the mysterious gloom of the forests. A certain instability, a certain restless activity is common to this entire world of spirits and ghosts. Now let me go through the history of the fairy in Western art. In the Middle Ages, fairies first became a popular subject in England after Gervais wrote about them in Odia Imperialia. He called them magical creatures and described them in many different ways. Small, tall, ugly, beautiful good, evil, etc. Depictions in art of the time reflected this, and fairies basically looked like humans. During the Tudor and Stuart periods, they took on a very different personality, also reflected in art. Robert Kirk described them as middle nature between man and angels, beings that weren't good enough for heaven or bad enough for hell. During this period, there were references to all kinds of fairies with different roles. There were pixies, elves, goblins, banshees, trolls, imps, and more, who all came under the banner of fairy, 
and all were mischievous and feared for their ability to curse humans. They were even said to drink blood. There was such a fear of fairies during this time that people wouldn't even use the word fairy in case they summoned one, and they even designed their houses and walked specific routes that would help them avoid upsetting them. By the time Shakespeare wrote Midsummer Night's Dream at the end of the 16th century, fairies were a little less feared. However, they were still usually miniature, magical humans with the power to curse and tended towards mischief and troublemaking, and still were not known to have any wings. A big shift at this time, however, was the idea that fairies mingled more freely with humans. The fairy painting genre was begun in late 18th century British art, even though it's known as a quintessentially Victorian product. Henry Fuseli saw the potential for fairy painting to entertain and edify the British public. In his efforts to establish a new kind of poetic history painting, Fuseli established the basic vocabulary of the genre, the quotation of high art and literature, the addition of folkloric themes, and the establishment of a central narrative scene surrounded by vignettes. Fuseli used Shakespeare's fairy play as the initial inspiration for darkly dramatic fantasy scenes that immersed mannerist-derived nude figures into a maelstrom of demonic happenings. His influence would be felt later in both Victorian fairy painting and illustration. William Blake, who lived around the same time, also incorporated fairy imagery and lore into his idiosyncratic cosmology. He saw fairies as nature elementals, rulers of the vegetable world. In this painting, Oberon, Titania, and Puck with fairies dancing, he imagines fairies as nature worshippers, miniature druidic celebrants of the corporeal earth. The king and queen of the fairies are presiding over a free-spirited dance, a fairy ring. He differs from Fuseli by concentrating only on the fairies without comparing them to normal-sized humans, and he also gives the fairies wings. He also mixed popular folklore about fairy interaction with the English household. The Goblin, a pen and watercolor illustration to Milton's poem L'Allegro, visualizes the poet's metaphors for the break of day, while also delineating popular beliefs about the positive and negative attributes of fairy behavior. Robin Goodfellow, the lubber fiend, is a domestic spirit who, upon completion of his tasks, hurls himself into the morning sky. Behind him, vengeful sprites punish a lazy woman who remains in bed, although the day has begun. Blake includes other references to fairy mythology, the ignus fatus, or the will of the wisp, which leads a foolish man astray, and an enthroned queen Mab, who presides over the fairy activity as she eats her pudding. Where Fuseli had set the tone for literary history painting, Blake provided the model for an imaginative use of scale and a schemata of body language for future artists to use when dealing with fairy subjects. After these two genre-creating artists, Victorian artists didn't really change the genre that much. They only further developed the same stylistic inventions. However, the Victorian era saw a massive growth in interest in fairies as a subject for literature and art. Fairy paintings even became a genre of their own, thanks to Richard Dadd, who I will talk about in a moment, and others. This phenomenon can be looked at as a form of escapism, born out of the massive social and environmental changes of the Victorian age. With the sudden industrialization, both artists and art lovers experienced a yearning for scenes and subjects that featured the natural world. The Victorians were fascinated by ideas of the paranormal, and while depictions of fairies were rooted in mythology, theater, and folklore, this seemingly delightful preoccupation was in fact a reaction to the social travails of the era. The spiritual, mystical aspect of fairy paintings in some sense symbolized the innocence people felt they were losing, for some even seeming to act as a conduit between the living and the dead. They became almost a motif for otherworldly experiences, 
Around this time, we also see the addition of wings more and more often. Fairies were impish, amoral, and hedonistic, something of a reprieve from the extreme puritanism of Victorian society. Fitzgerald even painted one piece that showed fairies in an opium den, a long way from the fairies of Disney movies of the 20th century. Fairies in the Victorian era are often seen indulging in pleasures at others' expense. In another Fitzgerald painting, Fairies in a Bird's Nest, fairies languish romantically in a nest but have seemingly shoved out a bird's egg to do so. Below them, the egg is devoured by goblins. The most well-known Victorian fairy painter is the troubled British artist Richard Dadd, who is largely responsible for the genre. Dadd was an insane man. His greatest work, The Fairy Feller's Masterstroke, was painted in the asylum. He was judged in many ways to be the model patient, retaining much of the friendliness and enthusiasm for life of his younger years. He never did lose his paranoid convictions, however, believing to the end of his days that he was the servant of the Egyptian god Osiris, sent to do his bidding on earth. Contemporary psychiatrists and neuroscientists have mostly concluded after his time that he was suffering from paranoid schizophrenia. His paintings made a strong impression on a young woman observing his work, who said, Dad's approach was different from any I had previously encountered. His colors are understated, the door grays and greens of a winter in the country. His fairies look unfriendly and almost threatening, and they seem completely immersed in their own world, their own private business. Looking in on them feels like a dangerous act of trespass. And its resistance to human scrutiny, the profusion of detail. Seeing the painting in the flesh also helped to make plain the years of work Dad had lavished upon his masterpiece. In contrast with the minute brushstrokes and refined surfaces that characterize much of Victorian fairy painting, the fairy feller's masterstroke is densely clogged and heavily textured, paint upon paint upon paint, as if to reflect the agony Dad suffered in attempting to convey a vision so personal and so traumatic he could never escape its hold on him. At the start of the 20th century, two works were published that are credited with changing the way we think of fairies. J. M. Barrie's Peter Pan and Cicely Mary Barker's Flower Fairies. Mary Barker's art shows an enchanting fairy world full of charming and innocent children's characters who were based on children from her sister's nursery school. They were fully innocent and pure, no longer tricksters and hedonists. They spent their days tending the flowers they were named after. Fairies had always been able to communicate with nature, but now this was in a sweet way, rather than cursing or controlling it for trickery. Disney then produced a movie version of Peter Pan in 1953, and the idea of playful, kind, flying fairies was solidified. Maybe soon, though, the treacherous, fearful idea of fairies will return once more.